From MTN News, this is Montana This Morning. A new schedule for School District 2. What would um, benefit the majority of our students? We'll tell you why the board voted to change next year's start date. Summer camps and some of that child care options in the summer. Will some of those change? And what it has to do with the weather. Good morning and welcome to Montana this morning on this Tuesday, December 19th. I'm Augusta McDonald. Billings Public School students will get their longest summer break yet. This after the board voted last night to start the 2024 to 25 school year later than ever after Labor Day. One of the main reasons for the change is the weather. The first week of school has been brutally hot in many classrooms across town. The temperature inside senior high rose to about 90 degrees last August. West doesn't have an AC and senior has part of the building has an AC. So in just attending school on, in this, during the summertime, I notice classrooms can be 90 degrees, 95 degrees, almost 100 degrees. And our students, our teachers have to go through that process for about two to three weeks. Garcia says the school district would have to ask for millions from taxpayers to install air conditioning in schools that don't have them. He feels this later start is a better solution. Also happening at last night's school board meeting, high school baseball is coming to Billings. Skyview, West, and Senior will all feature double-A teams, each with their own playing fields. They won't start playing until the spring of 2025. That's really exciting. I know uh, a lot of people have been kind of advocating for that for a while, wanting to get baseball, not just club teams, but the school districts as well. So that's exciting. Well, yeah, that is very exciting for them. Cool. Yeah. All right. Well, not much change in the forecast. Next couple of days going to be warm, going to be dry. You could part. go play a baseball game you right now. You could today. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Temperatures in the In a t-shirt. <laughs> yeah, not too bad. Now, we do have some changes in the forecast. We're, we're keeping an eye on a developing Pacific trough. We think it's going to make its way in for the weekend to cool us down and give us a chance of snow, not only in the mountains, but here in the lower elevations. And we'll tell you more with the main forecast coming up. Yesterday, a good 17 degrees above the norm. High getting up to 52, and that's kind of what we're looking at all the way through Friday. Our overnight low of 23, just a few degrees above average there as well. Top gust yesterday of 34. We could still have some breezy conditions today. Uh, maybe some gust over 20, 25 miles an hour here in Billings. Still a chance over 50 miles an hour along the western foothills this morning, especially around the Livingston area. That should ease up a little bit as we go along today, but gust over 30 miles an hour, not out of the question, at least through tomorrow. Now, it's been very dry out there. You can see the monthly totals uh, for the moisture. Look at the snow totals for the month and for the year. We are well in the hole. Now, even if we do have some snow this weekend, it's not going to put much of a dent into those snow totals. But, hey, any type of moisture at this point, any type of snow, we'll take it especially as we head toward Christmas, you know. 42 right now at the airport feels like 35. Winds out the southwest at about 14 miles an hour. Across the area, we've got 30s and 40s. You can see uh, even uh, 25 at Glendive, just south of you, we have a wintry mix. You can see that little slug of moisture there as this area of low pressure kind of pulls away, and that will go away with it. So highs today all the way through Friday, of 40s and 50s before the change this weekend. We'll take a look at that change. Cup it up here in just a bit. All right, Miller, thank you so much. You. And now we have an update to a story we've been following since this weekend. We're learning the names of the four teenagers who tragically died in a car crash over the weekend. Our Haley Monaco has more on the victims and the families left picking up the pieces. Our community is rallying around the families of the four teenagers who lost their lives here in a car wreck early Saturday morning. Now a memorial is left behind. It's been filled with flowers, stuffed animals, and notes of people who have come to pay their respects. This is not something that you would ever um, anticipate happening. Four Billings families are dealing with the unimaginable now without their teenage children after a car wreck early Saturday morning. I can't even imagine what they're going through. This is a, a absolute devastation and the worst thing that can happen right before Christmas. Helping amid the tragedy is Tanya Kemper and her team at the Billings Man Shop, the barbershop where Kim Coden works. Kim is the mother of Zoe, one of the 14-year-old girls who died. We're trying to do anything and everything that we can, and I believe that us girls are going to start, you know, sending her over some food and stuff too, so. A GoFundMe has been set up for Kim, a single mother, to help with funeral costs, rent, and bills, as well as a jar at the barbershop collecting money. I think for the most part right now, Kim is really numb. And she's, I talked to her today and she is trying to wrap her head around the situation. I know that she keeps mentioning she wants her daughter to walk back through that door and she's not going to do it. 
The three other families also have ways to donate to help them cover the unimaginable task of holding a funeral for their children. These are just a few of the words shared on their fundraising pages. Storm Lee Skaggs was 18 years old. A family friend writes, to know Storm was to love Storm. Weston Lyon was 17. A family friend writes, his mother and eight-year-old twin brothers are pushing through this Christmas season with an emptiness in their hearts. And McKaylee Ryder was 14, described as a spark plug who ran to the beat of her own drum. I want the families to know that my heart is with them. This is a, an absolute devastating situation. And um, we're all here for them to help in any way that we can. And I hope and pray that the community will come together. For links to the fundraiser pages and more ways to help the families, visit ktvq.com. In Billings, Haley Monaco, MTN News. Haley, thank you so much. And a Montana District Court judge overturned a decision from the Human Rights Foundation on a back and forth dispute between a state and a former Department of Corrections employee. Adrian Cotton says she was terminated from her job after accusing then director Reginald Michael of sexually harassing her. Several other women made similar claims against him. The state says Cotton's job was eliminated due to restructuring with the state hearings officer saying there's no link between the conduct and Cotton's dismissal. However, the next year, the Human Rights Commission sided with Cotton, awarding her four years of lost wages. But now a district court judge says the Human Rights Commission exceeded its authority. Cotton can appeal to the Montana Supreme Court. Montana has one of the highest rates of children dropped from Medicaid in the nation. Now the Biden administration is pushing Governor Greg Gianforte to use certain federal rules that make it easier to get families back on coverage. The Secretary of the Health and Human Services Department sent a letter to the governors of nine states, including Governor Gianforte. These states are responsible for 60 percent of cases involving children who were dropped from Medicaid between March and September. This comes after a federal policy that required states to keep people in the program expired. Here in Montana, a majority of the Medicaid recipients who lost coverage lost it simply because they failed to provide requested paperwork. Now we go overseas where the conflict between Israel and Hamas continues to have global implications. Some companies are now pausing shipping in the region due to attacks from militant groups. CBS's Jared Hill has more. Chaos from the Israel-Hamas war spilling over into international commerce. BP Oil and other shipping companies say they're pausing transit in the Red Sea following recent attacks on commercial ships by Yemen's Houthi rebels. U.S. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin in Israel Monday announced a new international coalition to patrol the region. These attacks are reckless, dangerous, and they violate international law. Israel also continues to face threats from Hezbollah in Lebanon, with increased fighting along the border. Lebanon launching this rocket strike on a northern Israeli city yesterday. Israel's military released this footage of its retaliatory strike in Syria. It all comes as international pressure mounts on Israel to scale back its bombardment of Gaza in its war against Hamas. This is Israel's operation, and I'm not here to dictate timelines or terms. Though Secretary Austin says he did push Israel to do more to protect civilians and allow for more humanitarian aid into Gaza. A baby was reportedly among those killed after two strikes on residential areas in southern Gaza this morning. Meanwhile, Hamas has released footage of three elderly male hostages in what Israeli officials condemned as a criminal terror video. It's a sign of a living if life. The White House says it's working hard to get another hostage deal between Israel and Hamas, though yesterday a Hamas leader said there would be no deal until Israel ends its strikes. Jared Hill, CBS News. Six House Democrats with military or national security experience have sent a letter to President Biden expressing concern over Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's military strategy. They argue his strategy is not in the best interests of the U.S. The U.S.'s security nor Israel's. Also topping headlines this morning, Texas Governor Greg Abbott signed a law that authorizes state officials to arrest and seek the deportation of migrants suspected of illegally crossing the border with Mexico. The immigration law, one of the harshest in the U.S., was passed earlier this year by the Texas legislature. It's set to take effect in March, but legal challenges could hold it up in court. And Pope Francis formally signed off on allowing priests to bless same-sex couples. The landmark policy stopped short of approving same-sex marriages, but it allows priests to bless the couples as long as the ritual isn't a wedding or civil union.
And this week, it's crunch time for holiday gift buying and sending. CBS's Elise Preston got an inside look at how the Postal Service is keeping up. The Christmas crunch is on with shopping and shipping in full swing. So it's hanging on the edge, you know, not knowing if you're going to get everything or not. Retailers are rejoicing over what could be record holiday sales. The average shopper, according to Gallup, expects to spend $975 on gifts this year, a number not seen since the 90s. The buying boost signaling consumer confidence despite economic headwinds like inflation. People want these moments, even in the chaos that's going on right now around them, to be special for themselves and their families. To get those gifts where they need to go, the U.S. Postal Service Processing Facility in Los Angeles is in overdrive. 24 hours, seven days a week. We're processing about a million packages every single day, all the way until Christmas. Adding to the crush, e-commerce. To help move all that mail, there are more machines this year. High output sorting machines that can do 10,000 packages an hour. How important is it for you to get these packages out? It's so critical. Everything that comes in today goes out tomorrow. Now the Postal Service says don't procrastinate. Wednesday is the last day to send holiday cheer through its priority mail service. After that, you'll have to spend a little extra. Elise Preston, CBS News, Los Angeles.